Vector math is often ignored by animators and designers that are just starting to learn animation. However, it's one of the most powerful tools and understanding it will help you elevate your motion graphics to a whole other level. And in today's video, we're going to take the vector math node and try and simplify it and visualize exactly what each of the operations does. So with that, let's demystify the vector math node. Essentially, a vector is like a number that has three different components. So for example, this is a vector because it has three different numbers present in a single vector. So this vector vector could be something labeled like a. Now generally this is corresponding to the x-axis, this corresponds to the y-axis and this corresponds to the z-axis or the z-axis depending on whether you're talking in British or American English. And they signify the distance that the point is on the x-axis, the y-axis and the z-axis correspondingly. In geometry nodes you can add in whatever vector you want using a simple vector node. As you can see they already have the x, y and z components that you can label. However you can't directly connect this into a group output and that's why I I've just created my own little node called vector visualizer which will allow us to plug in a vector and actually see it in the output. So let's suppose we have a vector that's pointed in the positive quadrant or let's say the first quadrant which means it'll have a positive value on all three of the axes. So let's just keep it at two on all of the axes for now. So you can see it's two axes on the positive x, two on the positive y and two on the positive z. If you go to the top view you can see how it's two and two and even on the side view you can see it's exactly two boxes and two boxes implying it's pointed at exactly two comma two or comma two. So this is what we would call a position vector when the start of the vector is present at the origin and the end is wherever the actual particle or whatever you're pointing to is present. But there could be vectors that don't start at the origin. In that case, we have this vector start socket that you can use to choose where the actual vector is starting from. So maybe it could start from 1, 1, 1, 1, which would make a vector like this. However, for most situations, we will be using position vectors itself. So we're going to keep this at zero and we can start visualizing even more vectors in the scene. So we'll just label this vector as vector A. And now let's create another vector. Let's join them up using a join geometry. Let's label this vector as B and give it some other random location. So if we want to make it in the second quadrant it would have to be having a negative x value so let's make this minus 2 and now you have vector a and vector b. Vector math is essentially operations that we do on each of these vectors to get different results. Let's just change the node names to a and b so that we don't get confused. Now we'll start off with the basic vector math operations that are present in normal math as well such as the add, subtract, multiply, divide and multiply add. Essentially when we add vectors we add each of the components separately. So if we had a vector a equal to 1, 2 and 3 and we had a vector B equal to 4, 5, and 6. So this corresponds to the x, this corresponds to the y, and this to the z. When we do a plus b, we simply get 1 plus 4, which is 5, 2 plus 5 which is 7 and 3 plus 6 which is 9. So that is how a plus b works but because we're using actual vectors and we can visualize this there are a few really neat techniques that you can visualize with vector math that isn't straightforward if you haven't studied vector math before. So let's actually take vector a and vector b and add them together and see what the resultant vector actually looks like. For that we'll use another vector visualization node, plug this into the vector and we'll label this as a plus b. Now when we plug this into the joint geometry you see you get this vector a plus b but instead of adding them in you could have actually done this geometrically by using what's called the parallelogram law of addition of vectors. If you take a look at this a and b because they start off from the same point or at least they intersect at one point they are what's called coplanar vectors. That means they lie on the same plane. If you want to visualize the plane on which they lie I've also created this plane visualizer node where we can take these point sockets plug them into the joint geometry and now you can see that vector a and b lies on this particular plane itself. They're flush with the plane and they don't protrude out. But the cool thing to note is that A plus B also lies on that same plane. So ideally you could take the points from here as well, connect them in and you can see the plane on which they lie. But an even better consequence of this is that if you scale this down to one, you'll realize that A and B are the sides of a parallelogram and the vector A plus B is the diagonal of that parallelogram that was drawn. So that way, no matter what the two vectors are, when you add them, if the two vectors were to form a parallelogram, the summation or the addition of those two vectors will always be equal to the diagonal of that particular parallelogram. So you can see how you can change one vector to whatever you want and the summation changes accordingly. So that's just a fun way to visualize vector math addition. But you can see the same thing occurs with subtraction as well. But there, there's a very 
fun change. So subtraction also, you subtract the x from the x, the y from the y, and the z from the z. But when you change it to subtraction, you see that a minus b, let's rename this as a minus b, actually becomes the other end of the parallelogram. But the cool thing is that this vector does not have to lie over here. But remember, we could use the offset to shift its position without changing the actual direction and length of the vector. Because remember, something that you need to note is that there are two types of values, scalars and vectors. Scalars have only a value, whereas vectors have both a value and a direction. So essentially, as long as there's a value and a direction, the vector remains the same, but the position of the vector can change without affecting its properties. So let's go ahead and shift this a minus b to the tip of b. To do that, we can simply take this b vector and plug that into the offset. And now you can see a minus b essentially joins the tips of the two vectors a and b to form a closed triangle. So that means whenever you do a minus b, you essentially get the same length as the distance between b and a and the direction is going to be from b pointed towards a. So that's very important and we use it a lot of times while creating our motion graphics, especially in the new simulation nodes. Now similarly, there are a few types of multiplication, but the most basic is simple multiply. In this particular method, there's going to be x multiplied by x, y multiplied by y, and z multiplied by z, maintaining a vector output with an x, y, and z components. But as you can see, the moment you do multiplication, it's not necessary that the resultant is also on the same plane. The resultant could be on a third dimension, and that's why we no longer need to actually visualize this, so let's just mute it. We also don't need it to start off from the tip of b, so let's remove the offset. So this is what simple vector multiplication looks like. And because negative into negative is positive and things like that, you can see that even though you have two vectors towards the right hand side of the z axis, which means they're both in the negative x axis. If you actually turn this way, you can see that they're both on the left hand side, but the resultant is actually in the positive x axis because negative into negative yields a positive result. So that way you can actually get really cool results just by using simple vector multiplication if necessary. The same goes with division and multiplication multiply add is the same as the multiplication addition of non vectors where you multiply it first and then have another amount of addition added in after the multiplication. So it's essentially multiplying it by one vector and then adding it by another vector afterwards. So they all have their own use cases. But more importantly, we have to come to the other types of multiplications that there are, which are the dot product and cross product. So we'll start off with the cross product, which is very, very important. The cross product is always going to give you a vector as an output that's pointed perpendicular to both the vectors that are being multiplied. So in this case, if you look at A and B and you look at the plane that's formed by A and B, you get this particular plane. However, the cross product, which is A cross B, is giving us a vector that is perpendicular to this particular plane. And a vector that's perpendicular to the plane is actually called the normal vector, which essentially means it's just pointed outwards from the plane. Now, as you can see, this this vector could actually have been pointed in this direction or it could have been pointed in this direction. But to figure out whether it's going to be pointed in this direction or that direction, you have to use what's called the right hand thumb rule, which means if you're multiplying A into B, remember over here, we're doing A into B as in A is the first socket and B is the second socket. And in that case, you take your right hand and you curl your fingers from vector A to vector B and whichever direction your thumb is pointed in, that is the direction that your final vector is going to be, which means the cross product is not common mutative. A into B is not the same as B into A when you're using the cross product. So let's plug A into socket B and B into socket A. That way you see the direction flips and now we have the vector pointed in the other direction. So you have to be careful as to which direction this normal is going to be pointed in based on which vector you're multiplying first. But this has a really cool property and that is that if you now take this normal vector, which is the cross product of any two vectors that are present on the plane, and you multiply this using the cross product product with any other vector, that new resultant vector will always be on the plane itself. And that we exploit quite a bit as we've done in this particular video. For an example, let's duplicate the cross product and plug it in here. And now take this resultant and we'll call this A cross B cross C. And you can see that no matter what the second vector is that we're multiplying it by, so essentially this is some random vector, the actual line is always going to remain on this plane itself. If you look at it, the vector is always lying on the plane and it's it's never able to leave the plane. Remember, the plane is also infinitely long per se. We can just increase the scale indefinitely. And you'll see that A cross B cross C, no matter what the vector is, will always lie on the plane. So you could multiply this by some random noise vectors or anything such as this. Remember, the color is 
a vector output, which means we're getting a complete random output. But right now, this does not take in field values, so I can't visualize it with a noise texture. So no matter what random vector you place, it's never going to leave the surface of the plane. And we can exploit that to create different textures or growths that grow along whatever surface you have. Of course, there could be multiple surfaces. And as long as you're having one cross product with the normal of the surface previously, and then having another cross product with any other number or random value, it will always stick on the surface of the plane itself, which is very useful. The next thing that we need to visualize is not the cross product, but the dot product. What's the difference? Essentially, the dot product, as you can see over here, is a gray dot as an output, which means it is no longer a vector that comes out as the output. When you multiply two vectors and you want a scalar as an output, you use this dot product. So to visualize the dot product, we can use a combine XYZ and plug this value into maybe the Z socket and then plug this vector into the vector and we'll call this A dot B. Now, if we look at the dot product, the dot product is essentially going to start getting longer as we change this on the X axis. But at one point, suddenly you'll realize that it becomes absolutely zero. And that happens when this vector A and vector B are perpendicular to each other. So no matter what axis it is, as long as there's one axis where it's perpendicular to each other, the dot product will become zero. Similarly, if we were to make both A and B pointed in the same direction, so let's say vector A is 1, 1, 1, 1, and vector B is also 1, 1, 1, 1, you can see both A and B are coinciding right over there. And the value of A dot B becomes a value of three. Because if you actually look at the math of A dot B and we have a vector, let's say one, two, three, and we have another vector four, five, six, a dot B is going to be equal to one into four, which is four plus two into five, which is 10 plus three into six, which is 18. And then you actually add these up, which is equal to 32. So the output is going to be 32. So in the case where we had one comma, one comma, one and one comma, one comma, one, we got the output of one plus one plus one, which is three. If the two vectors are pointed in the exact opposite directions, you get a value that's negative. As you can see over here, by having one at plus one comma one comma one and the other one at minus one comma one comma one we get the a dot b product to be minus three so essentially using these two you can check whether two vectors that you have is present in the same direction that way you'll get a positive value so essentially no matter how close they are as long as they are overall towards the same direction you'll get a positive value if they're perfectly perpendicular to each other such as one is like this and the other one is like this forming a 90 degrees angle you'll get a value equal to zero and if they are in somewhat of an opposite direction it doesn't have even have to be perfectly opposite. That means one vector is in this direction. The other one could simply be like this, or it could be perfectly opposite, or it could be almost perfectly opposite. All of these will give you a value lesser than zero. So by using the dot product, you can actually check whether the vector is oriented in the same direction or not. But as you saw, even though we're using a value of one comma one comma one, this output is not fit within minus one to plus one. The value can go even greater. As we got over here, we got plus three and minus three. So that's where we use the next important vector math concept, which is called normalization. So instead of the dot product, you can look at normalize and normalize always takes in only one vector and the output is going to be a vector. Let's just visualize that. We'll call it a n and normalize will always make the length of the vector be equal to one. Right now you see the vector a does not have a length of one. It might be pointed at one unit on the x axis, one unit on the y and one unit on the z. But from Pythagoras theorem itself, you know that if this is one and this is one, this is actually the root of two. So similarly, we have the third axis as well. So it's clearly not one. On the other hand, this normal normalized vector, which is this vector over here, even though it looks like it's not even reaching this one and one, when you actually take a look at the length, the length is going to be perfectly one. Similarly, if you had a very small value for a, the normalized vector will still have a value of one, but in the same direction of a. If you rotate a by changing its actual value, you'll see that the normal vector also changes its orientation. But no matter what happens, the actual length of this a n vector is always going to be one. So that is what the normalization does. And that way, if you were taking the dot product of two vectors, you could pass them through this normalized node first. And then when you get the dot product, the dot product would be between minus one and one, where minus one would be if they're perfectly in opposite directions, plus one if they're in the perfectly same direction, and zero if they're perfectly perpendicular to each other. That's how you use the normalized node. But there's another type of multiplication, and that is the scale. So what the scale does is it takes this particular vector that 
that we have and just multiplies it by a value on all three of the axes, which means it just makes it grow. So we're going to call this AS or A scaled. And essentially, this will also make sure that it remains in the exact same direction as the original vector. As you can see over here, it's always maintaining the exact same direction. But by changing the scale, you're able to make it a much shorter vector or a much longer vector like this. So that's what the scale does. And it's also very useful. In most scenarios, you'd first normalize the vector so that it gets a value of one and then you can scale it to become the exact value that you want, no matter the size of the original vector, whether the original vector is small or large, as long as you normalize it first and then scale it up by some value, it'll always be that exact value. So let's say we first normalized it and then scaled it by a value of three. This length will always be equal to three units, no matter what direction or no matter what the value of A is. It'll always stay put at exactly three units. Finally, there's two more that's very important, which is the length and the distance. The length is simply going to take in some vector, let's say this one, and the output, as you can see, is a scalar, and it's just going to be equal to the length of the vector. To visualize it, we'll use a combine XYZ and just plug it into the Z value like before, so that when we press one, we can just count the number of units, and that is the length of the vector. And remember, it's harder to tell the length of a vector because a vector has three components, and mathematically, the length of the vector is going to be the square root of the X component squared plus the y component squared plus the z component squared. So this is going to give us the length of the vector. And that is simply because it's Pythagoras theorem in three dimensions. In two dimensions, if let's say this was the origin and this was the point of the vector, this length, as we know, has an x component over here and a y component over here. This length is going to be x squared plus y squared under the root because of Pythagoras theorem. So this essentially does that with the third axis as well. And that's what the length node does. But you can also find the distance between two vectors which means you can take A and then find the distance from B. And that way you'll see that this particular distance between this and this is going to be equal to this particular length that we have from this distance socket over here. Similarly, there are a few more that you can do. There's always reflect, refract, face forward and things like that. I'll leave those for another video as well, but they also do come in handy from time to time. So in this case, A reflects across the normal of B to form this particular vector. So those are different things that you could do. They're a bit more advanced, but they're definitely worth checking out because you never know when you're going to need them. So hopefully that gave a little bit of an introduction to vector math and how you can visualize it using Blender. If you want to know how I created these nodes, let me know. I'll maybe create a video on this node setup itself. It's fairly simple and I don't think it's too useful for anything except for visualizing these nodes. But of course, if you want to know, let me know and I'll create a tutorial. If there are other concepts that you would want me to go through, definitely let me know and I'll try to create videos on those as well. Until the next video comes out tomorrow, be sure to check out other tutorials that I have on my channel because I post a video every single day. And until then, keep creating and stay creative.